Hello, everyone, and welcome to Emory Riddle Aeronautical University's Aviation Outlook webinar. I'm Ken Witcher, and I'm the Dean of the College of Aeronautics at the Worldwide Campus. Today, we have an amazing guest joining us. And to introduce him, please welcome the Chancellor of Emory Riddle Aeronautical University Worldwide Campus, Dr. John Wittrat. Thank you, Dean Witcher. Today on Aviation Outlook, we'll be talking with Jared Isaacman. Jared is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and is mission commander of the Inspiration4 space flight. Inspiration4 is the world's first all civilian mission to space in, to inspire support for St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. Jared with the crew of Inspiration4 are scheduled to launch from Kennedy Space Center in the fourth quarter of 2021. Jared is also the founder and CEO of Shift4 Payments. Shift4 is the leader in integrated payment processing solutions. The very definition of an entrepreneur, Jared started Shift4 payments in 1999 from the basement of his family home when he was 16 years old. Today, with a dozen offices across the US and Europe and more than 7,000 partners, Shift4 securely processes over 200 billion in annual payments volume and provides technical solutions for more than 200,000 businesses. Jared is an accomplished pilot, rated to fly commercial and military aircraft. He holds several world records, including a speed around the world flight that raised money and awareness for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. He has flown in over 100 air shows as part of the Black Diamond Jet Team dedicating every performance to charitable causes. He and his companies are dedicated to supporting a range of charities. In 2011, Jared co-founded Draken International, a company that provides tactical aviation services to all branches of the US military, Department of Defense, and global allied militaries. He sold the company in 2019 to the Blackstone Group and remain CEO until 2020. As you can hear, Jared is an extremely accomplished entrepreneur and he is generous beyond measure. We are, we are exceptionally proud that among his great accomplishments, he is also an Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University alum. He graduated, graduated from the worldwide campus in 2011. We are honored to have Jared with us today and look forward to learning more about his vision on the program today. Thank you. Back to you, Ken. Thanks, Dr. Wachrat. Before we speak to Jared, let's take a, let's learn a little bit more about the Inspiration4 mission. We're calling our mission Inspiration4. It's the first all civilian mission to space. And given that significance of that first, we're trying to be incredibly thoughtful about the people that are going to join us and represent us on this mission as part of the crew, as well as the organizations that we want to, to benefit from this effort, which is why we selected St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to be the, the charitable beneficiary of Inspiration4. This is a significant first step towards a world where everyone can go and explore amongst the stars. One of the things we hope to accomplish and why we named our mission Inspiration4 to inspire others to be able to do extraordinary, maybe even unthinkable things like go out and venture amongst the stars today, but also to inspire people what's possible that can still be done here on Earth. And if we can accomplish all of that, then we, we sure as heck better have tackled childhood cancer along the way. Jared, that's one of my favorite quotes. If we can accomplish all of that, we sure as heck better have cured childhood cancer along the way. That's just an amazing quote. I certainly do. First of all, welcome back to Emory Riddle and thanks so much uh, for joining us here on Aviation Outlook. It's, uh, it's an honor, truly an honor to have you with us. Uh, so you're down at the Cape right now and going starting training, getting started on this. And, and, and within just a few months from now, six months or so, you're going to have a commercial astronaut uh, wings, and you're going to be headed out to space. How does that feel? 
it's pretty incredible. And and hey, thank thank you so much for for having me here. It's really it's my honor to come and uh, to speak to uh, all the uh, you know the Emory Riddle people who tuned in. Um, yeah, it's amazing to be here at, at um, you know Kennedy Space Center. And tomorrow's the big announcement of the full crew, where uh, people actually find out there's going to be two Emory Riddle alum going up on, on Inspiration Four a little bit later this year. And like you said, it's uh, it's just under six months away. That's amazing news, and we're we're we can't wait for that for that announcement. So the crew's all together down there now. And, and obviously this is a little bit different than, you know, if you guys were all NASA astronauts and you're kind of just waiting your chance to get a, to get one of those missions to space, you'd kind of know what is about what was going on, but this was kind of created differently. And I think that lead in video really does tell us a lot about what's going on there. What, where'd you get this idea from this, this commercial space to benefit St. Jude and go out and fly in as the first commercial crew? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I've been kind of knocking on the door of the commercial space industry for a long time. I mean, ever since, geez, 2008, I went over to Baikonur to see the Soyuz go up. And, you know, I've, I've been a pilot for a really long time. And I feel like that could be, you know, the pinnacle of a, you know, pilot's career is getting to operate a spacecraft in orbit. So just kept knocking on the door and, you know, figured, you know, maybe someday, you know, they would open it and say there's a chance. And, and what I didn't expect is it was going to happen so soon or that it would be the first. I mean, it was just like four or five months ago. I mean, literally, it was right before Crew-1 went up. Uh, and when I did find out that it was going to be the first, the first time, you know, a global superpower, you know, didn't send people into to orbital space flight. It was like, wow, that is incredibly significant. Let's let's pause and think this through because this just can't be like, you know, four fishing buddies going into space, cool. right? Like that can all happen down the road, you know? I mean, that that's what you want actually is to make space like really affordable and accessible for everyone. But the first comes with a lot of significance. So we wanted to be really thoughtful about the crew members that we were gonna select and what kind of message that they would be able to deliver people, not just those that wanna be astronauts someday. I mean, you know, you take a look at our crew member who represents hope. I mean, you know, she's gonna deliver a message to people that you can run into all sorts of adversity in life and, you know, and overcome them and still live your dreams. And they may never want to be astronauts. So we wanted to be really thoughtful about the crew and we wanted to help solve like a really important cause here on earth so that, you know, you'd be able to earn the right to go and make progress up among the stars. Um, so it really came together quick and, and here we are with the big announcement tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. And, and Haley, which we have already been announced, of course, she's going to have a couple of firsts next to her name as well. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, youngest American to go into space, um, you know, first uh, pediatric cancer survivor, and she'll have a, uh, uh, a prosthesis too, the first um, uh, astronaut with a prosthetic, um, you know, so I'll, she's breaking a lot of new ground. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So you mentioned going over and watching one of the Soyuz launch and, and seeing that going, what, what made you come to SpaceX? Was it just because they were the, the furthest ones down the road, or is there some kind of different connection there? I was going to say, where else are you going to go? I mean, that's like, right. they're, it, it's SpaceX and then uh, and then it's like everyone else. Um, yeah, I mean, they are like light years ahead. I mean, obviously, I'm like a super fanboy when it comes to all things like SpaceX related. I mean, you know, no one else is, you know, you know, recovered a first stage like they have. And then, you know, let alone, you know, I was just like an hour ago seeing their fleet leader that's, you know, launched into space and their first stage has come back nine times. Right. Like so they're just they're just light years ahead of everyone else. I mean, their philosophy is fantastic. You know, they want to fail fast, you know. They, they're, they're not discouraged by failure. They celebrate it. You know, you guys can probably see all those Starship launches they're doing. It feels like every couple of weeks, you know, it crashes. People are cheering because they got good data to advance their cause. So, like, they're just in a league of their own. And, uh, yeah, I mean, couldn't be more thrilled to be able to, to ride on a Falcon and Dragon up to space. Sure. So let's talk about that a little bit more, too. You know, obviously, here at the Daytona Beach campus, just driving over today, I saw six or seven aircraft in a pattern, young pilots learning how to be uh, professional aviators. They're entering this industry. Of course, it's going to be completely different. But if they're flying a Boeing or an Airbus or something like that, they like to go to the company and kind of see the culture of the company and what's happening where these beautiful aircraft are being built. When you take a walk through Hawthorne, how, do you, what, how does that make you feel? That's a different kind of company down there, isn't it? It is. It's, um, I mean, you know, I've had a chance you know, my 10 years or so with, with Draken International, you got to, you know, work with a lot of the big defense primes and, you know, not, nothing against them. They obviously do really amazing work. Then you go to SpaceX, you see something totally different. First, just the pace. Well, you know, well I, let me clarify. I mean, it's a, it's a young crowd. I mean, uh, they actually just said today, like the average age of the uh, of an employee at SpaceX, and they have 10,000 plus is like 35, and that's up like five or six years, you know, um, from where it was, you know, just a just a few years ago. So it's like a, it, it's a different crowd, you know, very young. Uh, like tons of passion for the cause and they're making just quick progress. Like they're not afraid to fail. Um, like, you know, just 
walking in the hallways there, you see, um, you know, just uh, Merlin motors that are being assembled. And, you know, from one day to the next, like they're gone. They're already being shipped out. You know, like it, it, some of the big defense primes, like that that motor is going to sit there for five years until you know somebody comes along and tells them to move it or something. So it, it's just like it's it's eye watering stuff. So the so the speaking of the work that they do, the ship that you're going to fly is currently parked on the ISS. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, we'll be going to space on uh, resilience later this year. So uh, it's still docked on the space station. It'll be coming back uh, late April after uh, Crew Two gets there. And, uh, and then they're going to gen it up again and we'll launch uh, in, uh, you know, sometime in mid to late September. So if that correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be there on crew too, but that that will be the first time we reuse, will your mission be the first reuse of a, of a uh, crew dragon? No. So I think crew two, uh, so crew two, which is going to launch on April 22nd will be the second launch of that first stage booster. The first launch will have been crew one. So uh, they kind of kept it on ice until it was ready to go again. And then uh, the dragon that'll be on top of crew two will have been demo two's uh, dragon. So oh, endeavor. Uh, yeah. So your first fully reusable launch will be crew two coming up in uh, just a couple of weeks. That's just amazing. Uh, again, more SpaceX kind of leading the way there for that, for sure. So you, you can see there in your background, you're down at the Cape right now at the SpaceX facilities getting your, getting training really kicked off. Uh, I think this week was the first time you guys kind of started putting together the whole crew and getting it going. What's the what's the training like? Is, what's it, is it is it kind of like what you've experienced before in some commercial, you know, flight getting checked out in different type of aircraft and thing? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly some similarities. There, there's a bunch of academics. So, I mean, you got to know what's behind all the buttons you're pushing. And then there's a lot of, you know, simulator uh, training for all the things that are supposed to go right. And then you'll train also on all the things in the simulator that could go wrong. Uh, and then there's some, you know, extra fun stuff too. Like, uh, you know, we'll be actually at uh, doing some centrifuge training in just uh, like, like 48 hours, which will simulate all of like kind of the normal, normal uh, launch and, um, you know, uh, reentry profiles, and then some of the more abnormal ones like pad abort. And then there's stuff that has like no parallels to aviation at all, like going down the zip line uh, on pad 39A. Uh, that that's definitely more of like a you know, like a theme park experience compared to anything in normal aviation. Right, theme park, but think about the people before you that's had an opportunity to ride a zip line down pad 39A. We, we were up uh, on top of um, the, uh, the launch tower today and actually out on the crew access arm. And uh, you're just thinking about, wow, every Apollo mission launched from here, the shuttle missions, almost all the shuttle missions launched from here. And you're just like, you're just on like sacred ground, you know, it's sure. really incredible. So obviously things are super busy and fast paced for you right now, but do you, do you really get a chance to sit and think about that? I mean, Jared, you guys doing some amazing, really, you know, game changing kind of things here. Yeah, I, I think like we're all reflecting on this quite a bit. I mean, you know, really like all of the missions that came before, like we're truly standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, and then all the missions to come. I mean, that that's like, you know, we think of this as like just such an immense responsibility that you get it right, because if you do, I mean, imagine all the missions that'll come thereafter. I mean, you know, I do believe, you know, as you know, Elon and the SpaceX team clearly have for a long time that, you know, 50, 100 years from now, it's going to be the Jetsons life and you'll have rockets doing point to point travel on Earth. You'll have like a lunar and Martian base, um, but you got to get this first one right or else, you, you know, you kind of risk the timelines on, on all the great missions to follow. Yeah, there's going to be a lot to follow, but there's only one first. So let's talk about the... Uh, uh, let's talk about that for a second on the on the vehicle and 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 being able to operate that that air that uh, that spaceship that you're going to be flying. Uh, we know that that obviously this the Crew Dragon a lot of autonomy and on board that vehicle and it's it's you know if you see the pictures between the last time we sent Crew One up there they showed up on the Dragon and of course I think another crew showed up shortly after on a Soyuz. There's a big difference in those vehicles. Obviously, how, how much are you going to get a chance to do some do manual flight at all of of the Crew Dragon? Well, yeah, there, I mean, there's a ton of controls on there, right? I mean, I, I liken this totally to, you know, any of the, like the normal commercial, you know, type flying that you do in the US, right? Like, you, you know, you have an autopilot and it's on, you know, almost all the time on a lot of like, you know, cross country type flights, right? Um, so you can have like, you know, 6,000 hours, you know, flying jets, you know, probably, you know, like, you know, six minutes of it mattered the most when it came sure. to all the training, you know, something that you know, was really unexpected that you wanted to be prepared for. And it'll be no different on Dragon, right? I mean, there's a ton of um, 
automation built into it. I mean, they do unmanned crew resupply all the time without anyone actually in it. But if something goes wrong, you want to be able to have all the controls, you know, to, to kind of work through the problem, no different than any other, you know, airplane. And we, we definitely can, you know, change the orientation of the spacecraft um, manually up there. In fact, you're going to have to because some are more optimal for, you know, recharging batteries for thermal, some are better for communication, and some are just better for the view. Uh, so we'll be moving around a little bit. So on that part of it, on the on the manual, I'm sure you've had some time in the simulator to 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 manually fly the sim a little bit. Does that does that does any of your experience flying these fighter jets and the things you've had opportunity to fly? Is there anything close to that? Does it feel natural, or is it learning a completely different skill set? Uh, no, I mean, well, in terms of just like operating all the screens, I'd say like there is like you know tons of similarities to like you know a Garmin G G three thousand G one thousand. I mean, like a lot of similar kind of symbology. Uh, definitely some of like the newer like uh, corporate jets where all the systems are kind of integrated. So if something's wrong, it tells you exactly where it's wrong right. and then calls up a checklist right next to it to just help you work through it. Tons of similarities there um, between the two. That's great. So would uh, if you had to compare that to an aircraft that you've flown, is it more like the commercial, like the with the Garmin stuff in it? Or has it got the feel, you know, like a fighter or something would? Does it feel maneuverable, I guess, is my question. Yeah, I mean, so I, I don't, I, I'd say like from like how the screens are laid out and like the pages, um, you know, it, that you'd have a lot of similarities to almost any like glass cockpit type business jet, especially the more modern ones where, you, you know, it's not just like, you know, an EFIS, but it's really synthesizing a lot of systems information into it and checklists and such. Uh, in terms of like how you're going to steer it. Yeah, I mean, it's all push buttons, right? There's no, there's no stick. Um, there's no throttle. So uh, I'd say that's like, big differences for sure compared to most, uh, you know, aircraft you strap into. Sure. So all that automation with all those panels and of course the being the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon, you know, this is bringing us really something, a new vehicle for sure. First of its kind really and truly with that level of automation. Uh, you know, it reminds me back when we started bringing in remotely piloted aircraft back in the Air Force and it was a new process of the ground control station and it was very similar, had all the screens and everything. And, and of course, they were building a system and architecture to, to really do something for the first time. And a lot of those, a lot of those lessons we learned as operators, uh, you know, from a human factors perspective, some of those got missed that we discovered in, in that early stages. Do you get that sense? Is it, does the... Does the automation and the way the screens are laid out in the in the Crew Dragon does it feel natural to you, or does it does it feel like a, from an operator's perspective, from a pilot's perspective, things feel like they're in the right place to you naturally? Yeah, I mean, I I'd say like this is like um, a well laid out. Uh, I mean, these are the, these are the guys who you know also did you know some amazing things with Tesla too, right? I mean, there's sure. definitely some you know you know knowledge that winds up coming over from one side to the other. Um, yeah, I'd say it's super intuitive. Uh, to me, like I thought the nicest, you know, glass cockpit flight deck I've ever, you know, worked on was like a G1000, G3000 compared to like, you know, some of the, you know, um, other other ones that are out there. I'd say this is like kind of got that level of, you know, you know, kind of graphic user interface, really nice to work with. Yeah. So you've you've uh, you own a MiG-29, uh, which makes me laugh a little bit to say that out loud. That thing's producing what maybe what are you making out of that MiG-29? Fifty thousand pounds of thrust, roughly, on that on that aircraft. Of course, the weight's kind of down low. This the Falcon 9 uh, with the five Merlins on there. That thing's producing 1.5 million pounds of thrust. What what are you looking forward to that, or what are you excited about that, or what how do you what you think what are you thinking? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot of special moments that are going to be throughout the journey from, you know, ascent to hanging out in orbit and then, you know, reentry. But for sure, I mean, you know, walking out, you know, on the crew access arm, getting strapped in and then, you know, that kind of kick as, uh, as you're going up and accelerating to like 17,500 miles an hour. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting. So looking forward to that. <laughs> Outstanding. So when we talk about uh, again, back to the Crew Dragon conversation. You're going to spend what three days on orbit? Is that what the mission set up for right now? That that's what it looks like. So it, uh, it should be uh, about a 72 hour, three day mission duration. Yeah. So you're going to have uh, you know three soon to be your closest friends there with you, and the Crew Dragon living space is about I think I read about 328, 330 square feet of uh, living space there in that apartment. You guys are going to be in for a while. How, how, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, wow. That sounds roomy compared to, compared to how it looks inside. Um, yeah. I think all this is like super small price. First of all, from like spacecraft, like, uh, you know, uh, roominess standards, like dragons in a category of its own. If you ever look inside a Soyuz, I mean, that is not a, 
yeah. you know, that is not a, a, a pleasant, um, you know, experience, but no matter what, like all this is like super small price to pay uh, for the opportunity to go up and just have a different perspective on the world. Right. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll make it work and we get to use all of it, you know, in microgravity. So that's perfect. When you talk about that crew, you got some unique kind of opportunities you're going to expose this crew to. Of course, in, in many previous space flights, a lot of that folks are coming out with military experience or military survival training, understanding how to operate in uncomfortable conditions. But you're going to do something a little different to kind of bring the crew together to make sure that everybody understands that this could be, you know, this is a closed environment and it's really a hostile environment outside the spacecraft. What kinds of things are you going to do to expose the crew to that kind of, that kind of training? Yeah, well, first, like, we're super lucky. The stars really aligned with this crew. Like, when, when you hear all the names come out tomorrow, like, everyone has just such an amazing story. Everyone is kind of like, you know, a space, aerospace type geek. You know, I've got another pilot, you know, private pilot in there as well. Like, so a lot of people mentally were, you know, kind of dreaming that this day could come. So just being in the right frame of mind right from the start is a good place to work with. And then, you know, you've got you know, SpaceX and NASA have come together on good training curriculum. So you got like 60 years of lessons learned there to make sure, you know, everybody gets to that, you know, commercial astronaut level before launch. And, um, and in between that, I'm going to supplement a little bit. We're going to go up into the mountains, try and get everybody super uncomfortable here on Earth, you know, create some good mental challenges before they, you know, get up uncomfortable up in orbit. So, uh, and we're going to just try and pack it all in. I mean, we, we, we're we're going to get going pretty fast now. So you, you mentioned one of the uh, one of the crew members there, and I know you can now. We'll learn tomorrow who they are. Is uh, is a, another private pilot, and that just makes me think uh, again about the opportunity. And of course, this is Aviation Outlook. What's your what's your thoughts about the future of commercial flight? What's these young these young professional aviators are just getting their just getting their initial ratings? They're headed out into the industry. What does this look like for them, in your opinion? Oh, there's so much opportunity right now. I mean, you know, of all like the big name, you know, space um, like exploration companies that are out there, there's, there's tons of others you probably haven't even heard of. I mean, we're in like like the, the second big space boom right now. Um, and even outside of space, like in aerospace, right? Like, I mean, you've got a ton of good things going on with hypersonics right now. You've got new aircraft designs, new engine designs. Like they're going to need talented, you know, young people with good, fresh minds that are eager to roll up their sleeves and dive in. I mean, I, geez, I, I can't even tell you probably how many people that SpaceX has hired in the last like 60 days, let alone the last six months, like just tons of opportunity for it. And these, you know, a lot of these companies too, they're, they're going public, you know, they're raising capital. So they're going to be able to invest, you know, in their technology for years into the future. And it's going to take, you know, again, talented people to all make it happen. So um, I think one of like the best times probably in, you know, recent history to be getting into, you know, aerospace. Sure. Sure. And I, I know, obviously, you're, you're a very successful businessman and, and you kind of look at, you know, where there's an opportunity or where there's a, a, an opportunity to improve on maybe a process that's already in place. Are you thinking about that when you when you look out here at the commercial space industry as you go through this process? Are you looking at those kind of things that we're really young entrepreneurs are going to have an awesome time to make this a better, this civilian uh, commercial space operations really a more uh, a more viable option? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, right. I mean, you, you nailed it with opportunity. Like there, there needs to be, you need to see a problem that needs to be solved. There's something that you can improve upon, you know, in, in order to create a market, I think. And like, just right from the start, I mean, even if you, you know, take a look at like, you know, the world's most like probably kick-ass space company in SpaceX, like, you know, reusability comes at a cost for them. Like, you know, you know, there's, there's like, you know, heavy landing legs, there's propellant, you know, you know, they're not, no one's bringing like, second stage back there's no single stage to orbit like there's still a lot of room for improvement out there right uh so like nothing's already been solved like the way things are being done today won't be this way you know 10 years from now or 10 years thereafter so yeah i'd say like tons of opportunity well the, the you know the, the magic outlook question here is is are are we going to be around when we put our first base on the moon or first base on mars well, I, I would bet very heavily that um, on the uh, back to the moon thing pretty quick. I, I mean, wh whether there's a base or not, like, you know, human beings are going to be walking on the moon again pretty, pretty soon. I feel really confident about that. I, I think what, you know, SpaceX is doing in terms of, you know, their, their ambitions to get to Mars is like, I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable. Like, I think actually, you know, if they get there, it'll look like, you know, the Manhattan Project was pale in comparison in, in terms of this undertaking. Like, it is, you know, they're not trying to put two or three people on Mars and plant a flag and salute it and come back and say, we've been there. Like they're going there and they, they want to stay. Um, and like, I mean, just think about what, what a gift that is to like, 
humankind to make it a multi-planetary species, right? And everything that can follow from thereafter. So yeah, that one's like, that one's tougher. I mean, I, you know, you need some like Vegas odds makers to, to give you what the percentages and in what timeline, but uh, I'm very confident in the moon for sure. Sure. And your mission, Inspiration4, is going to contribute that from a science perspective, right? Yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we're trying to make uh, whatever, you know, small contributions we can in the grand scheme of things. You know, I, I think uh, one aspect of our mission is we're going out pretty far. So the, uh, the apogee of our orbit will be, you know, 540 plus kilometers. So, you wow. know, that's, you know, decently past the, uh, the space station and, you know, should, should be able to go up and just tap right above uh, where Hubble's presently at. And I think that's important. It's symbolic of all the good missions to come, but there's also things you can learn from it too. It's a different radiation profile at 540 kilometers than the 400, you know, that we've been studying for a really long time at space station. So, you know, one of our crew members, Haley, she's going to be drawing all our blood and, you know, storing that in vials. So I imagine like a big blood explosion in the cockpit or something. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll be taking up a bunch of different experiments too, to, you know, get whatever knowledge we can and bring it back to, you know, influence long duration space flight in the future. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fun to talk about the mission and how, you know, as a, as the commander, of course, this is your experiences are going to be just phenomenal, but I, I keep coming back to the video that we, that we showed there as we started this conversation and, and there is more to this than just a space flight. This whole inspiration for theme or our, our, our purpose is much bigger than that. Can you tell us a little bit about St. Jude and what your, what your hopes are there? Yeah, I mean, I think with any, you know, kind of great endeavor like this, you know, it comes with, you know, a lot of responsibility and, you know, you got to achieve this great balance of making progress and advancing the world for, you know, a, a ton of great benefit that comes in the years. I mean, just from progress, right? But you, you also have an obligation to take care of, you know, some of the problems and challenges we're faced with today. Um, this mission achieves balance on both and, and where the problems we're taking care of here on earth is, is with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, or at least trying to make a contribution to it. So we have the largest fundraising campaign in the history of the organization with a $200 million goal. You know, I'd say we're like, you know, 60 some odd percent of the way there. So um, we've got some work to do, but we got a whole year to get there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's important and I certainly hope it's a model you know, for other great, you know, endeavors to come, whether they're up in space or here on earth that, you know, you can make it, a, you know, bigger than the mission, you know, is in itself. You can, you can try and do an awful lot of good along the way. And we tried to do it with some past, you know, interesting adventures that I've been fortunate enough to be on. And we're certainly going to do it with inspiration for it. Sure. And, and obviously St. Jude, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up just across the river in Arkansas from St. Jude. And as growing up as a kid, I thought every town had a St. Jude. But once you get older and you get away, you realize how special that place is. That's really a special place doing just amazing work every day. It is. It is. So the, uh, the, the, the inspiration piece of this always gets me excited too. So there's, there's going to be, you're, you're kind of hoping for some side benefits here. Obviously the money, raising the money, get folks expired, inspired to contribute to St. Jude, but also maybe get some of the researchers inspired of what's possible to help with these, these diseases. But you're also looking at things like, uh, things like entrepreneurship to get some folks out there in business to, again, create that capital that solves a lot of these problems that we have to face. What's your perspective on that? Well, I think, yeah, it's all in the inspiration for name. And we, we are trying to deliver a very powerful, inspiring message to the world, but it's, it's inspiration in a number of different directions, right? I mean, some right. people are going to look up to the stars and say, wow, you know, someday I might have an opportunity to do that. And never thought it was possible because really up till now, you, you got a better chance of getting hit by lightning than becoming a NASA astronaut, right? And now, you know, you got four people that are not NASA astronauts that are going up into space, three of which, I mean, you know, a couple months ago, I had no idea that they were going to get, you know, fitted for a spacesuit. Um, and that's pretty cool. And there's going to be an awful lot more uh, of that to follow. But, you know, you've got inspiring message in a lot of different directions. You know, again, I, I think about Haley and, um, you know, again, she's our crew member who represents Hope. I mean, she's 10 years old and, um, you know, she got a, you know, a, um, a cancer diagnosis. Right. And, um, and she went through a really tough time and then she grew up and she became a physician assistant. She works at St. Jude now. And she's in the fight helping, you know, other kids, you know, overcome what she did, you know, decades earlier, right? And I think she's going to inspire a ton of people um, as part of this mission. Again, maybe some never want to be astronauts, right? Um, and then for sure, there's an entrepreneurial element too. Uh, one of our mission pillars, um, you know, is prosperity. And, you know, I think that, well, I, I mean, you know, there were literally thousands um, you know, e-commerce websites that were created in the last couple months as part of this competition. And I don't know if all of them would have, you know, done it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, 
it's a challenge to start a business, right? And, and a lot of them, if you saw some of the videos that were uploaded, I mean, uploaded, I mean super inspiring, right? So um, anyway, yeah, I think we're trying to deliver an, a very powerful, inspiring message. A lot of it is up, it has to do with up in space, but a lot of it has to do with what we can accomplish here on earth too. Well, it seems like, you know, part of your mission's already been accomplished. So let's go back to some of your flying experience and let's go back to uh, 09, I think it was, and you had an opportunity to set a world speed record, around the world uh, speed record in a CJ2, now very different than your dragon that you're going to be up when. What, how was that experience for you? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, in the spirit of it's okay to fail, uh, we actually tried our first attempt in 2008 in the Citation Mustang, which was awesome. And, um, you know, the premise behind it all was like, these are the early days of, you know, glass cockpits where you're getting, you know, next rad weather and you're getting all your information. You don't need to maybe necessarily, you know, do a bunch of flight planning on the ground. You might be able to do it up in the air. Um, I don't know if that's cool to say or not, but that was part of the idea, you know, and, um, and, uh, but again, kind of in the, sp the same spirit as what we do with, with St. Jude, it was like, well, you gotta, you gotta make the mission bigger than, you know, just a, a, uh, a record flight. You gotta try and do some good along the way. And, you know, that mission, those missions were uh, to raise funds for um, Make-A-Wish Foundation. That's right. And um, yeah, so we learned an awful lot from the 08 uh, attempt where we, uh, we did fail and uh, we learned what countries to, you know, avoid. Um, you know, there, there are some that don't like each other, they're in close proximity and that can create some challenges and, and every minute counts against you. Uh, so 2009, uh, we used the CJ2, which did get us, you know, about 250, 300 nautical miles more legs, which was good, that helped. Um, and, uh, and we got it done that time, uh, 61 hours and 50 minutes, it was like one of the best experiences in my life. So, so that 61 hour mission was, that's about, that was about a 20 hour reduction from your 08 attempt, right? In the Mustang. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, the actual record was like 80 some odd hours. We missed by one hour in 2008, but it, you know, we also spent like 12 hours on the ground, right. uh, you know, working through some, some, some challenges. Um, so we would, we would have beat it then if we, you know kind of picked our stops a little better so is that that's a key point you just mentioned right there is that from a pilot perspective is that the key difference between those two record attempts or the record setting the record in 09 was you just kind of did your planning a little better or was there some some luck in the in the uh in the flying that that actually helped you reduce that time yeah i mean so like coordinating everything in advance was really important because it's kind of like nascar when you're on the ground you're still the clock's still running so like having you know two fuel trucks with two overwing guns ready to go um, like the average on the second trip, like 19 minutes, you know, from uh, touchdown to take off, um, which is super quick turn, um, right for a biz jet. And um, so that that was that was helpful. But yeah, picking the stops was a, you know, was a was a big factor. Um, you know, some, uh, by the way, this gives like a total appreciation about how amazing it is to fly in the US. So for everyone who's, you know, <laughs> learning how to you know, learning how to fly right now, like really there is no better place in the world to, to fly, especially to learn in the United States. Like the whole even concept of like VFR is like not as much of a thing in other countries. Um, so like we wound up, you know, getting, um, you know, tripped up in a number of countries, but one, for example, like Japan, I mean, every airport there is on a slot system. Like you either make your slot time or you're, you're on the ground. Um, so, uh, you know, think about that now, next time, like you're walking out to the plane and you're feeling up and you just go fly whenever the heck you want. Uh, it doesn't work that way in a lot of other countries. So we learned a little bit and got it right in 2009. Yeah. So that you're, uh, you're, you're hitting on the themes that we hit here a lot at Ember Riddle too. Obviously we, we do the pilot training and the engineering and all the things that go around there and the human factors and the stuff you'd expect to see in, in the aviation operation side of the house. But we also have logistics and supply chain management and the, and the aviation business stuff that's so important to, to getting these missions off if it's from flying a dragon to, to making a world record. How did, how did the planning, the mission planning, the logistics part of that play into your, your, your record setting flight? I mean, tons, right? I mean, even just the ability to pay for fuel in certain countries can be a challenge if you don't work it out in advance. And that time is just, you know, counting against you, um, you know, when you're on the ground. So, you know, look, if you're going, you know, if you're in corporate aviation, you're flying, you know, a bunch of, you know, clients or something to another part of the world, and you're going to be there two weeks, well, then, you know, you know, you want to know some of your arrival stuff down, but you certainly have time to figure out how to, you know, pay for fuel and get loaded up and, and stuff like that. But if you're there for 19 minutes, uh, then you got to front load a lot of that work. Right. Um, and that means working with a lot of different handlers all over the world. And geez, I mean, some countries you're paying cash, you know, um, or you're not taking off. 
Um, so anyway, there, there, there is stuff that you just need to, you know, plan ahead when you're on these kind of quick turn profiles um, that we were on on those trips. So you mentioned that that record was uh, the charity was involved. That was Make a Wish. Was that was that your first effort to to reach out and and try to connect with one of these large charitable organizations? So, I mean, you know, even since like the earliest days of my, my company, you know, even the basement days, you know, we, we took our kind of, you know, you know, even then small business responsibility, it's grown to corporate responsibility pretty seriously. So, I mean, we have like a, you know, 20 year relationship with St. Jude. Um, I'd say our relationship formed with uh, Make-A-Wish, you know, a year or two prior to those record flights. And, um, you know, I've tried to support a, you know, a handful of, you know, worthwhile causes and such. So I've heard you. I've heard you mention in the past about this connection between Make a Wish and and St. Jude. What's what's your what's your perspective on that connection? Yeah, I mean, I and I, I probably haven't always worded it, um, you know, well. I, I first of all, I mean, I'm very uh, I'm very focused in these particular causes because I know you know how lucky I've been in life. Like you don't wind up where where I've been, you know, with you know, we've, I've had fortunate enough to have a lot of great business success. Like that means the balls bounce my way many many times. And then you think about some of these families that are just dealt really lousy hand in life, you know, sure. just, you know, unbelievably heartbreaking, you know, news that they find out and it just, you know, derails everything for them. And, you know, of course, certainly some, you know, especially with the good work they're doing at St. Jude, you know, you know, have great survival rates and they go on and, you know, live their dreams like Haley, one of my crew members, but then, you know, some of them don't and uh, it just shouldn't be that way. And uh, I think kind of earlier in my career, you know, um, I looked towards Make a Wish because, um, you know, with the the dollars I was able to contribute to support, um, you know, like for example, the 2008 record flight, it raised a hundred thousand dollars. Now that sends an awful lot of kids to Disney World or some other wish, and, and and I felt like that was where I was making the most impact um, with with those funds. But then I think about Inspiration Four, and it's like, wow, we could, you know, we could raise two hundred million dollars with that. Well. You know, if you get that to an organization like St. Jude, who's trying to do some real pioneering work, well, that means an, an awful lot less kids need a Make-A-Wish, right? right. And, and so right. I think just given the magnitude of the mission, that's why we, we kind of tried to, you know, prioritize uh, St. Jude in this particular mission. That's very insightful and a great point there. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing, actually, is what it is. So at your, when you finished up in 09 with that, that world record flight, you got into the, to the air show business with the Black Diamond Jet uh, demo team. What, what, was your, what, was, what drove you to the air show circuit? Uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a cool story. So it, it starts with one plane. Um, and then, you know, when you're flying, you know, one plane that's, you know, like an ex-military airplane, it's not long before you realize all of the, the fun factor benefits of having two planes. <laughs> right. I mean, there's all the formation flying, but then, you know, you can also fight each other. So then it was like, so one plane became two planes and then it's like, well, we should, you know, give them matching paint jobs. And it was like, but imagine if you had four planes, right. <laughs> and then four planes became like six or seven. And the next thing you knew, we had five L 39s uh, in an Arctic paint job. And then we had two MiG 17s. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just kind of went from one to two and, um, Really uh, amazing experience. I mean, some of the best times of my life uh, was doing that kind of flying, you know, precision formation acrobatics and jet aircraft was just super cool. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a couple of good years, uh, you know, running it. So let's talk about that flying for a little bit. Did you have a dedicated position you flew on the team? Yeah, so I was right wing, so two right. was my number. It's nice. So yeah, the right side is the uh, tight side, so. I, was <laughs> I hear you. The uh, uh, that's a that's a unique kind of training there. I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough years ago to spend a little time on the air show circuit with the uh, with the uh, Air Force demo team, and and uh, man, that's an interesting circuit. But more importantly, there's a lot a lot of effort that goes into into that kind of flying. Did you enjoy all the training, all the that level of concentration all the time? Was that something that was uh, kind of inspired you, motivated uh, you? Like seriously, some of the best times of my life. I mean, first it's like I I I enjoy that kind of flying more than anything else. Like just the precision around it. Um, but then like you know the whole group. I mean you know it becomes a great brotherhood. Right. Like just awesome camaraderie. As you know, like you know when you're on the road, um, and it never slows down. Um, so uh, you know we um, like we had a training season, but that was like that was it. It was one training season, and then you're flying. You know. 10 times a week together. So like, you know, it never, you never kind of get out of um, currency. It's um, so yeah, it was, um, 
it was a ton of fun. And we had, you know, just uh, pilots from the Thunderbirds, so our, uh, our slot pilot and our uh, left wing pilot, who also doubled as a, as a solo pilot too, were fresh off the Thunderbirds. I mean, they came right off their two years and right onto the team. So they brought all of, you know, the experiences that the Thunderbirds had, you know, figured out over, you know, you know, decades and, and helped them um, kind of raise the bar with, uh, with Black Diamond pretty quickly. Sure. So as a fun part about on the airshow circuit out there is that you, you work every weekend, but it's never really feels like work, does it? Yeah, no, it, no, it was, uh, it was, a, it was like a rock star lifestyle. It was, it was pretty awesome. So. <laughs> So you were flying the L-39 in that, in that number two position there with that team. Uh, what do you think about that aircraft? Did you enjoy, do you enjoy that aircraft? You got, you got several of them, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, I, I love that airplane. So um, yeah, I probably, you know, I don't know, maybe close to 1500 hours in the L-39. I, I, I haven't I lost count in a while, but um, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's super simple aircraft. Uh, I mean, you know, before you ever take off, you have enough, you know, um, you know, in the accumulator, uh, the hydraulic accumulator to put your flaps down, put the gear down and brake. Um, and it's all manual flight controls, right? So um, even, you know, you, you lose an engine, you know, you have a fire. I mean, people have landed L-39s in like, you know, grass fields at 90 knots. So it's incredibly safe. Um, it's easy to get out of if you ever had to, but I mean, you know, short of like, you know, um, you know, like a midair or something really significant like that, it's, it's a plane you can, you can put down almost anywhere. So it was incredibly reliable for us. I mean, we had, you know, I mean, five jets, 100, 500. I mean, you had thousands of sorties over a couple of years, thousands of them. And like very, very rarely would you ever see a picture of a show that didn't have, you know, the full team. Yeah. Yeah. So that, what? It makes your, sense. It means I can't say we're in the same category there. Those, those, those they had more reliable uses, the solo jets. Did you get checked out in the MiG-17? I did not. I did not. So um, we had two solo. We had we had a great solo act, and uh, there's there are pictures, plenty of good shows pictures out there where you saw two of them together, but not quite as often as um, as uh, the full L thirty nine team. Sure, sure. So that what in your training? And by the way, I have to ask, what was the what was the first did you did you grow up? Did you start training on a one seventy two? Uh, so uh, one eighty two was. Uh, was the piston I sent uh, piston single that I flew um, to get my private? Engine. So obviously you went through that process, got checked out in some more of the larger uh, jet multi-engine type aircraft. What was what in your training do you think helped you the most? Uh, obviously we're going to have a lot of uh, pilot uh, student pilots around here. What in your training helped you the most? Do you think that that you lean back on when you get in those situations, like if you're doing that really close, really tight, low level formation flying, real precision flying. Is there part of your training that was like, ah, that was the skill I picked up early on that's so meaningful now? You know, honestly, when I like, um, I haven't uh, taught formation flying in a long time, but like the, the most impactful thing that I ever had told to me, and it's the first thing I say to anyone else before they do it is like, just understand the other aircraft does not want to hit you. Um, they will do everything they can possible to be super predictable. <laughs> so, um, because, you know, your first couple, you know, formation flights, like you, you, you're getting in very close and then immediately it's like, Whoa, and you pull away really fast because you see just the slight movement or something and it freaks you out. Um, but like, once you convince yourself, like the other airplane knows you're there, has zero interest in making you scared, right? Like they're just as likely to get, get smacked if something goes wrong. So they're going to be very, very predictable. Um, nothing aggressive kind of gives you the comfort that you can get in there, um, you know, and be, be very calm, very focused without, uh, without much fear. And like, once you convince yourself of that, you know, you're not, you're not like very jumpy at the controls at all. And you can't be, because you're really just making very, very, very minor uh, control movements when you're flying that close. So out there on the right, right wing, where would you look in the hold of formation, hold your positional formation? What, was there a part of the number one aircraft that your lead aircraft that you looked at to kind of make sure you just lined it all up? Yeah, that's right. So we put the star on the, uh, the helmet. Uh, if you could uh, imagine, you're looking through the wing basically, and you're, you're taking these stars that we had painted underneath the wings and you're, you're kind of superimposing it where you think the leads, um, you know, helmet would be. And you're just holding that spot. So we, um, you know, uh, like the Thunderbirds have are a little bit, you know, more spread out and um, uh, like the Blue Angels, which was a lot closer to kind of how we flew formation are stacked down. 
um, and they're kind of looking up through the wings. And it's cool because it gives that, you know, a good impression that you're, you're pretty close because you, you are, but you just stack vertically. Um, that's how we flew. So I would be looking up through uh, the lead's wing and, and just keeping that star where, uh, where their, their uh, cranium would be. So. so did you ever jump in and ride in any of the other positions? Uh, I did. Uh, so, but never in a show. We were always pretty disciplined on that. But, uh, you know, de definitely like on cross countries or something, you know, I, I've uh, flown uh, the slot position quite a bit. Super easy one back there. And uh, uh, I've tried uh, left wing and I, I've flown with some of the solos too. But I, I you get really comfortable. Like, I, I'm like really good just looking left out of the, uh, out of the plane. Right. That's amazing. Spoken like a true diamond pilot there. You know, the slot's nothing. Those guys are right wing there for you. That's perfect. Uh, so just to, you know, to, to kind of uh, talk about the, to wrap up the, the air show conversation there, what's, it's been a tough year for the air show circuit for this, this last year. What's, what did you, did you, did you get behind the mission of air shows and what they were about? And it's, it's very similar, of course, from my perspective to what you're doing with with inspiration for did do you see uh, you know that the air show business is going to continue to move forward there's a there's a future for that type of flying you know i it, it's to me it's hard to imagine like what you know during the season what's better than like taking your family out and watching an air show i, I mean i i think like it's a great family thing to do you know every community you fly into it's super charged up about it um yeah i, I don't think it's going away uh, anytime soon at all I think people love to come out and, and watch the acts. And yeah, I think there's a lot of young people who go out and watch the shows and, you know, someday dream of growing up and flying in an airplane, just like that. I know that's a, you know, big part of the mission of, you know, kind of the big, you know, military demo teams. And, and we kind of just wanted to play our little small part in it. So. Yeah. Getting folks motivated for the aviation aerospace industry. We need so much of that uh, today, obviously that the talent to keep the workforce uh, growing and, uh, and the talent that we need to keep the keep moving forward, like what we we're talking about with the folks out at Hawthorne, that crowd out there is it's it's there's a there's a passion about aviation aerospace that that is uh, that is just unique, and I think air shows obviously uh, may be the spark for a lot of that uh, a lot of that moving forward. So let's let's uh, let's go down the road just a little bit after the air show business. I think it was the air show business and your and the folks you you flew with there that kind of got you thinking about. Your next big adventure, which was which was uh, Draken, uh, Draken International. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, so um, that's exactly how Draken was born. Was out of Black Diamond Air Show team, really. And um, you know, I think what it was is like, you know, what we were doing is like super expensive. We were we were we were a seven ship, um, you know, jet team. Uh, so um, you know, there's no there's no sponsorship dollars or anything that can ever you know kind of offset that. So. I think the idea was we're, we're kind of having the time of our lives right now. This isn't something you can do forever. Um, it's not something we want to do forever. I mean, there isn't a, you know, jet demo team out there that, you know, hasn't had a, a rough patch or two. And, you know, we were fortunate not to have any, you know, any significant incidents. So the idea was, can we pivot this into something more commercial? Um, and then you look for opportunity, right? You know, what's the problem to solve or what can you improve upon? Um, and we look to, you know, the commercial adversary business and say, like, there's tons of opportunity here. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, um, elements to support a business case for having, you know, commercial operators of ex-military aircraft. I mean, first is just pure cost delta, right? I mean, we were able to put up, you know, six A4 Skyhawks for the same price per hour as a single F-16. Uh, and that's pretty important because, you know, as, you know, some of the adversaries know, like, quantity is a quality in its own right, right? So just sheer number of aircraft is a lot of problems to solve. Um, and then it's also just the useful life on the current fleet of military aircraft, you know, the fourth gen fighters that are still the backbone F-16s, F-15s, you know, they're not getting any, you know, younger. Um, and the airplanes that are going to replace them aren't coming fast enough. So every hour we could absorb on one of our airframes was an hour that they could save. And then the third was just kind of focused training, because if you look at like kind of the early, you know, um, you know, red air, you know, blue air training in like the military, like maybe an F-16 would just not go into afterburn you know, or would just, you know, you know, dial out um, or, you know, zoom in the range on the radar or something down to a smaller scope. Um, but when you get into fifth gen, you know, if you, if you want to like, you know, dumb that down to an adversary, but you're turning everything off. You're, you're not getting a whole lot of useful training out of it versus probably, you know, 30 years ago, you know, they were, they would still get tons of good training out of, you know, doing, doing red air. So the idea that, you know, we could absorb, you know, it almost arguably became negative training actually using like a 90,000 hour F-22 to, simulate the bad guys. So 
you know, if we could put up a lot of aircraft, you know, at a, a far lower cost um, and still, you know, be, you know, kind of, you know, tactically relevant adversary where you could still cause some problems, then there should be an awful lot of demand. Uh, and that's how we decided to kind of pivot uh, our airshow team into something more commercial. And it, it wound up growing into like a $6 billion industry. So you guys are still, that the, the Drake International is still out flying red air out at Nellis, right? Oh yeah, I mean, this is only growing. Like they're, they're, you just can't, you can't get enough of it, right? I mean, it's everything that we thought was gonna be the case. It's true that, you know, if you put up, you know, four F-35s, well, they're gonna want 16, you know, bad guys, right? Like that's, that's, that's kind of the trade that, the U.S. made going for like, you know, pristine, you know, exquisite, you know, capabilities on our, our fighter aircraft is it's okay to buy less because you'll be able to deal with a whole, you know, host of problems. Well, that's what, that's what they want. So there's just an unbelievable appetite for, for red air. Yeah. And I agree with you. Yeah, this is going to continue to grow back when uh, my last days out in Ellis, they, you know, they were flying F-15, F-16s, they were painted uh, aggressor colors and still out there doing that mission, which you're right, tied up a ton of active duty resources to go do that business. And I can totally see, matter of fact, I, I just read that uh, one of the aggressor organizations down in around Goodyear, Arizona picked up F-16s, fourth gen fighters. But you guys got some some pretty, uh, you guys got fourth gen as well, don't you? Some rides F-1s or third yes, gen? Yes, I, I got to support the home team in Drakken. So uh, yeah, I mean, they, they got some some tired old F-16s, but we got some, uh, some <laughs> modernized uh, F-1s and um, we have A4s, we have cheetahs from South Africa. I mean, if you're like an aviation enthusiast, I know a bunch of people probably on this call are. I mean, you know, Draken has assembled some really interesting aircraft. Um, you know, it's a shame we didn't have some of these when they were filming Top Gun too, or we could have just, we could have just looked so, so badass. I mean, you know, you, you take a cheetah and put an interesting paint job on it and it's going to look very similar right. to the, some of the bad guy aircraft out there. So anyway, yeah, Draken's got some really awesome stuff. And the, the truth matters like we, we do win sometimes like you don't you don't you don't want to like but you know when somebody does make a mistake like you know Draken has the, the aircraft and capabilities to kind of punish those mistakes and it, it happens every day and those become really good you know lessons learned for um, you know for the good guys. So yeah what a great you're right what a great lesson to learn that's for sure. So when you're accumulating that 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 uh, that Air Force that basically you built their aggressor Air Force I heard a rumor that you guys like bought the New, New Zealand Air Force just bought it. Yeah, that's right. So um, uh, New Zealand made a political choice in 2001 to basically disband their, their combat air force, like their offensive capability, and basically took more of a defensive maritime patrol. So they have, you know, like uh, P3 Orions, they have helicopters, um, you know, they've got some Texans that they train their pilots in, but basically anything that, you know, would, would have like a real offensive capability, they, they decided to stand down. And we came in and bought that fleet. So that was A4 Skyhawks, so for all the Top Gun fans, you know, obviously Viper and Jester, they were flying A4s, um, but not like ours. Our A4s were modernized with a baby F-16 radar in it, um, you know, and, and, a, and a good data uh, bus so that we could carry some interesting pods and such. So that's what the New Zealand government had. So we bought all those. Um, and we bought their Aramaki MB339s, which became a, a really cool, you know, uh, platform we used with some of the test pilot students. Um, so. Yeah, we, we, we were lucky, but man, we wound up buying fleets of aircraft all over the world. And it was, uh, it was a really interesting experience. <laughs> and I bet there's a, I bet there's some folks joining us on this call, knowing our, our worldwide student population that are probably fought against your team and uh, they might not want to share their story. <laughs> hey, Jared, did, did you ever get checked out in the, in the A4? I did. I actually, I actually was checked out in the A4 before Draken existed. So, really? uh, I think it was in 09, um, I, uh, I took a, uh, so I got checked out in the Collins Foundation. Uh, they have a TA-4F, uh, it's pretty, you know, I wound up being lucky to fly every, pretty much every A4 version, but that was uh, like a Marine, Marine, Marine Corps specific version. And, um, and that was what got me exposure to the platform. And I wound up uh, flying it in formation with some, uh, during a Vietnam heritage flight at Oshkosh in 09. And uh, so, yeah, being already kind of familiar with the scooter is why I got like super excited about the New Zealand ones when they, um, when we had the opportunity to buy those. Right. But yeah, I wound up getting checked out in those. Uh, and I, I've flown the, the N model, the L model, the TA4J, the K model, the TA4K. So I got to, I got to fly a bunch of good A4s. So uh, looking back on your, 
on your uh, on your logbook. Obviously, you're about to put a, a crew dragon in that in that column over there. But out, excluding the crew dragon, what's the what's the probably what's the funnest aircraft that you've flown? Yeah. So I mean, the, the I have a few favorites. I mean, the MiG twenty nine is definitely you know the you know the sexy aircraft of the day. There's no question. I'm super lucky to get to fly that airplane. Um, you know, twin engine, fourth gen. Um, it's just pristine, but I mean, just talk about some other ones that are, you know, people less familiar with. Um, one of my favorites was the A4N Skyhawk. So, um, uh, when the Blue Angels flew, uh, the A4s and when Top Gun flew A4s as adversaries, what they did is they stripped down everything from it. And then they put a big motor in it, the J52 P408, which has, you know, 20% more thrust. Uh, so you actually could get to one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio. Uh, wow. on a clean A4, uh, you know, with about half internal fuel. So that was just like a rocket ship, you know, so uh, got to fly that, love that, flying that airplane. And then um, our L159 Alcas that we brought back from the Czech Republic, that was the first airplane I flew that had like a really modern, you know, radar system in it. And that that was just really fascinating for me because I, I didn't have a, a military background to be able to kind of play around with all the toys. And it was pretty cool. Sure. But the MiG-29, that's a, that's a nice one. Mm-hmm. It is so how would how did you how do you go back and checked out in a mig 29 yeah so uh i got a, a, a great uh instructor pilot so uh, actually in 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 the room with me right now so when i was making some jokes about the slot position i've got just like four feet from me as a former thunderbird uh number four so he flew the slot position so that's why i had to take some shots there and actually my uh my mig 29 instructor uh pilot is in the room as well because they're they're both uh play like a really key role in inspiration for and we're here at, at spacex right now but uh yeah, so I'm, uh, you know, uh, really lucky. He's a, you know, test pilot background. So, you know, getting into unfamiliar aircraft is like, you know, totally normal for him. So, uh, you know, he took to the 29 really fast. Yeah, and you're going to take your Inspiration4 crew up too and get them some experience in high performance aircraft as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to do some L39 flying, we'll do some MiG-29 flying. And um, yeah, again, the idea is you want to create, you know, a, as much stress and uncomfortable environments here, unfamiliar environments to people here. Uh, so that they're able to kind of handle those situations when they're a little bit farther from home. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, Jared, I, I tell you what, I want to be respectful of your time and our audience's time. It has been an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. We love talking to airplane stuff. The audience that we have here at Emory-Riddle, both at uh, campuses that are going through initial flight training and getting their degrees in aviation, just starting their careers in the aviation aerospace industry, all the way out to the worldwide uh, students, which obviously you were a part of there for a while, uh, to, that are kind of advancing their career in this, man, to hear these kind of stories and to see what you're doing with Inspiration4, not only from the flight perspective, but also that inspiration that's going to really change this world and, and address something like childhood cancer. That's just amazing. So this entire Emory Riddle family is, is awful proud of what you're doing. Um, really, really appreciate the support. So uh, hopefully uh, some can get out and see the launch a little later this year. You're not too far away and should have a good uh, dawn view. That's what we're timing. For good dawn view. Those are the good ones, aren't they? Well, that's perfect. You're going to have a uh, you're going to have a, uh, a bunch of the Simrod family down there cheering you on, I'm sure. And and, uh, you know, if we don't get to talk to you again, uh, you know, the whole team here wishes you a Godspeed and with that with that flight and and, uh, and and when you get back to Earth and things get settled down a little forward, come back and join us again. Maybe tell us about how that mission went. I look forward to doing that. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. So to learn more about the Inspiration4 mission, uh, just go to inspiration4.com. And it's, it's a lot to learn. It's a great, great story, as you guys have heard mostly already. And don't forget, you can watch any of our previous webinars here at Embry-Riddle. Uh, the, on the YouTube channel that we have out of the Emeritus YouTube channel, or by going out to the web page and clicking on uh, past presentations. That web address, if you want to go out there for it, is erau.edu uh, forward slash aviation dash outlook to go see those previous uh, recordings. Or you can just Google that if you want to at Emeritus Aviation Outlook. Uh, we would also like to, we also like to, we also appreciate your, we would appreciate your feed, feedback on what you, what you've liked about the Aviation Outlook series or any ideas that you might have for, for future guests or future topics. Speaking of our uh, future guests and future topics here, our guest for the next Aviation Outlook, which is on April the 13th, is a great friend of the University of Emory-Riddle and, and the stuff really legends are made of, Eric Lindbergh. He is the, he is the grandson of, of Charles Lindbergh. Uh, he's an artist, he's an adventurer, he's an avid pilot, 
He holds commercial instrument flight instructor and glider ratings. And back in 1996, he helped launch the X Prize Foundation, uh, and that, which ended up giving out that first $10 million prize that was awarded to help jumpstart the commercial space industry. So a lot of what we got to talk there uh, with Jared just in, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, you know, things that got aligned to kick that off that, that uh, Eric was involved in. He's been one of the industry leaders in accelerating the development of, electric, of the electric aircraft industry. He's the co-founder and executive chairman of Vertigo Aero, which provides powertrain systems and emergency and engineering services to the emerging uh, electric aircraft industry. Vertigo Aero is also a partner of Embry-Riddle's Research Park, working with our faculty and our students in developing and commercializing patent pending technology designed to, to uh, mitigate the electric aircraft noise. Our thanks once again to, uh, to the founder and CEO of Shift Four Payments and the mission commander of Inspiration4, Jarek Eisenman. And thanks to the many participants from around the world that have joined us here today. For the deans of the College of Aviation and College of Aeronautics, and for everyone here at the Embry-Riddle family, thanks for joining us. We hope that uh, we hope we get to see you again on April the 13th for the next session, next webinar. Thank you very much.